You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast with your hosts, Andrew Chang and Justin Goddard. Hello and welcome to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. My name is Andrew Chang and alongside me is my co-host, Justin Goddard. Tonight, we're going to wrap up the Buffalo Bills position review group by covering the defensive backs. You can find us on most social media and podcasting platforms and even on YouTube by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. We got a content-packed episode for you today, so let's break down the agenda. But first and always, Justin, how are we doing tonight? I am wonderful tonight, my friend. Thank you. It's Cole Sheezen out here in Rochester, Jenny's Finest. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Can't complain. The weather finally feels like it's turning around. Our apologies for jinxing the weather if you listened to the last episode. Yeah, you said that I... last week and it went south, yeah. but you called that. Yeah, I definitely called that. So my apologies, everyone. So let's break down the episode. I got some, we have some, I'm sorry, Bill's highlight of related news to quickly a cruise through. We're going to focus in on the defensive back position, which of course, of course includes the safeties and the cornerbacks. After that, Justin has some draft prospects for us to talk about as the Bills might be in position to actually take a cornerback with their 30th overall pick in the 2021 draft. And then lastly, we're going to preview into next week's episode. So let's talk about some Bills related news. A lot has happened since the last episode. And the reason why a lot has happened is because we recorded our previous episode basically a week before we were supposed to. And again, it was because I had to go to a little birthday bash for Happy myself. Birthday. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start off with the biggest news, in my personal opinion. The Jets have traded Sam Darnold to the Carolina Panthers for a 2021 sixth round pick and a 2022 second and a fourth round pick. You know, at first glance, Justin, I thought this might have been too rich. But then I remember to myself, you know, Josh Rosen did go for a second round pick. So maybe that's just the value for a questionable quarterback in today's league. I do like Sam Darnold, for the record. And I don't think this changes too much for the draft board. I still think four or five quarterbacks get taken in the first. We just know for sure the Jets are going to do it now and the Panthers aren't. And much like the Dolphins, the Jets are stocking draft capital. So, Justin, how do you feel about the Sam Darnold move? Yeah, so not very surprising. Um, you alluded to the value there. The The second round pick makes it too rich for me. You know, you, you talked about uh, Josh Rosen having a second in there. That was a couple of years ago. Um I have a buddy that's a Carolina Panthers fan, and if that was like a third and a fourth next year, like, sure, take a flyer on the guy. But, you know, we've seen Sam Darnold for a few years. Maybe a change of scenery will make him the next Tannehill, sure. But, mm-hmm. I I mean, I, it's not great value to me. So, right. I don't know. The Jets are, or I'm sorry, the Panthers are fools if they don't still take a quarterback. Right. Well, I, you know, in this position, I don't think they're going to, but we'll see what happens. I'm interested to see how that draft board falls. Let's Mac move on. Mac Jones at eight. <laughs> Maybe. So the Bills also signed offensive tackle Bobby Hart. He's entering his seventh season in the NFL. He sure up some depth along the offensive line. I think he looks super sus in my opinion, but what do I know? The Bills also signed offensive lineman Jamil Douglas. He's, again, guard in center depth. He's got that flexibility, so it's good for good competition for Ike Bakker if he doesn't get scooped up um, somewhere else. The Bills also signed line, linebackers Markel Lee and Tyrell Adams. Both of these dudes have starting experience, which is awesome. Markel Lee... It seems like this man always has injuries, so you know the Bills love that. <laughs> Probably brought in for you know to compete for the backup linebacker position. He plays a lot of special teams. Tyrell Adams, on the other hand, again probably brought brought in for the same reasons for backup linebacker position. 
We all know who the starting linebackers are here, guys. So remember, if we bring in someone else, no one's getting edged out. At least the starters aren't getting edged out, in my personal opinion. And Tyrell Adam, Adams also plays special teams. But not as much as Markel Lee. So maybe Markel Lee has the edge there. Justin, tell us your thoughts about these moves real quick. Yeah, I feel like they're all kind of like the bottom of the depth chart. I'd be surprised if any or most of these guys made the roster. The one that moves the needle for me the most is Bobby Hart, and it's in the wrong direction. Uh, It's great for me that he started for the Bengals and all that. Um, He has starting experience, but dude was a turnstile. Um, He has... some terrible athleticism at the NFL level um, coming for me. We'll get to the combine episode, but I don't have much to say on that for myself. But you know, as it goes, I don't, I don't really get excited for any of those players that we've added. Just kind of tail end of the depth chart uh, competition, right? And then last but not least, the white face Max. Love they're, it. They're here to stay. We got a super clean look now. Definitely top 10 in the league. How does that make you feel? I love it. I I would wear the whiteout jerseys, pants, face masks, all that every game if we could. I Icy. love that uniform. It's amazing. Icy, for sure. Love it. All right, let's transition to the defensive back rooms. In my opinion, this is the strongest position group that the Bills have. I really, truly believe that. So let's start with the safeties. Micah Hyde. This man got a well-deserved extension. Great at disguising coverage. Even better at taking away the deep ball, in my personal opinion. Think about that Tyreek Hill play in the AFC Championship game. If Micah Hyde isn't there, that's going for a TD. And the play that I'm referring to is the screen play where linemen are out in front of Tyreek. And Micah Hyde's just keeping him just in play so his other teammates can catch up to them and stop that from being a touchdown. And Tyreek had two linemen in front of him, and Micah Hyde still defended it perfectly. Justin, tell me you have the same affinity for Micah Hyde as I do. I absolutely love Micah Hyde. Um, He's one of those staple moves for me with being where he brought in this guy that was kind of an outcast elsewhere and believed in him and put resources around him and just turned him into, I mean, this combination of Hyde and Poyer, which we'll get to, it's got to be top five in the league. And I just absolutely love Micah Hyde. I love Poyer. I love what they do back there. They're always there. It's steady consistency. And we just have two great players there that are matched by very few in the league. Right, right. Transitioning over to his uh, partner in crime, Jordan Poyer. I love Jordan Poyer. You're going to hear me say I love so-and-so because that's how good this group is. (laughs) So my apologies, but I love everyone on this secondary. Uh, Well, not everyone, but we'll get to that. Just like Micah, he got a well-deserved contract extension. The Bills have one of the best safety tandem duos in the league, as you alluded to. And it's funny how underappreciated they truly are like i don't understand it but we can get into that we also learned a lot about jordan poyer and his substance use this off season as i mentioned previously i think he did a great job of using his platform to generate awareness which is super cool like real top notch above the cut kind of level stuff in my personal opinion now let's transition to what he can do on the field The guy has a nose for diagnosing plays, Justin. Multiple instances of this. But the one that stands out to me, at least recently, again, I'm going back to the AFC Championship game. I'm thinking about Kalai Edwards-Alaire catching that ball out of the backfield and (laughs) getting cracked by Jordan Porter. Justin, tell me your thoughts about Jordan Porter. Yeah, and Jordan Porter is probably one of my favorite players on the team. Um, I remember there was a time that I I wore the wrong hat. I got a hat signed by Jordan Poyer. Um, I went out to uh, John Fisher for a training camp. I think it was, I'll say, three years ago now. And practice wrapped up, and, you know, everybody was going over to that 
that media VIP section where all the players sign autographs. And Jordan Poirier started trotting off that way. And he, like, stopped and thought for a second. And then he went off to, like, this right side of, like, the practice field where there was just a a small area fan still. He stopped and he signed autographs for everybody that was on that side of the field. He was already staying after practice, working on catching balls, signed autographs for everybody. And then he trotted back on the field and he started catching balls again. And, like, he just keeps working. That dude is one of the... He, every year he's a Pro Bowl snub. Every year he puts up good film. Every year he's playing. I love that dude. Right, right. Let's move on down the depth chart here. Jaquan Johnson. I'm not sure what his role is on the team outside of special teams. He's very good at it. Don't get me wrong. And I know he had a great play. Oh, well, you know what? No, no, no. Yeah, he did, he had a he had an interception against. The Jets against the recently traded Sam Darnold in Week 17 and during the 2019-2020 season, that seemed to stir up some conversation about you know maybe he can usurp someone on the team like a uh, Micah or Jordan. But luckily that just died as quickly as it came. <laughs> I wasn't about it. Didn't buy into it. I don't know who was responsible for running that fake punt pass actually against the Patriots, but I knew he threw it. And it was a dime. Justin, tell us about Jaquan Johnson. Yeah, there's there's not much to him so far outside of uh, special teams player. Um, but he does a very good job at that. Um, Bean has shown with, this, with everything he's built with this organization. Being a really good special teams player is enough to keep you around. I'd like to see if he develops into, you know, maybe we have a six-round pick steal that develops into you know, a Micah Hyde or a Jordan Poyer replacement. Mm-hmm. Right now I like his value on special teams, and I think that's enough to keep him a roster spot. Right, right. Transitioning to the last guy, Josh Thomas. Not much to say here, which is probably a good thing. No offense. Uh, I didn't even really know who this guy was, <laughs> if I'm going to be honest to myself, which means we're pretty thin at safety, and I don't think a lot of people are talking about this. Dean Marlowe is still out there as an unrestricted free agent, but if he doesn't resign, this position needs attention. Justin, let's wrap up the safeties group. Tell us about Josh Thomas. Yeah, I think Josh Thomas is one of those practice squad guys that we just kind of have to trust the process on. They wanted to keep him around all season. We didn't really get to see much of him. I think realistically, Dean Marlowe probably signs back on like a veteran minimum deal, probably one year deal. Um, but safety is uh, an area that's becoming a sneaky need for kind of planning for the future. Right, right. Well, that's going to wrap up the safety room. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. We're going to wrap up this episode by talking about the corners. Starting up, Tredavious White, a.k.a. Big Play Trey. Now, I know he didn't have as many interceptions as he did last year, which is okay, because that just tells me nobody wants to throw it in this man's direction. I love his energy that he brings. It's, It's almost infectious, Justin. It's positive, and it's just plain fun. I remember when the Bills traded for Stephon Diggs, and I thought to myself, this is only going to make Tredavious White better because iron sharpens iron. Tredavious White is elite. Let that settle in for a second, Justin. Isn't that so nice to say? I I was kind of bummed out when we lost Stephon Gilmore because I knew he could be that good, and we just got a cheaper, younger version, and... People can argue this potentially better version of Stephon Del, uh, Gilmore, which is, is all great by my record, so I'm cool with that. Lastly, can we please, 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 Bills Mafia, stop talking about the Mahomes trade? Hindsight is 2020, and we have Josh, so it's fine. Justin, tell me how you feel about Tredavious White. Uh, Tredavi- we talked earlier about uh, Poyer being one of my favorites on the team. Trey White might be my favorite on the team. 
Uh, I just I love what he can do on the field. You know, take any team you play starting receiver and limit what they do to every other team. Uh, he shuts down that receiver and you know you can formulate the rest of your defense around how you're going to cover whatever gaps um you know the in yeah you said the interception numbers are down it's because people don't want to throw at him um i love the initiative from bean to um give him that extension before all these other cornerbacks started getting paid it's kind of like that the hometown discount in reverse where it's like you know we drafted you, we developed you, we're committed to you, and we want to get this done for you. Mm -hmm. It means a lot to the players when something like that happens, but it also works out on the back end, money-wise, that you know we saved a few million dollars from uh, what Jalen Ramsey's contract ended up being, what, two, three days later? Yeah. It was big. <laughs> yeah, real big. Let's, uh, let's talk about the opposite. Levi Wallace. You know... I I wasn't on the Levi train when he first saw action in the 2018 season. I had thought to myself, I don't like our opposite corner being an unproven commodity, right? Fast forward today, and I think he's proven to most of the haters that he's a reasonable starter in the league. He shows moments of greatness. I think about, you know... Uh, the pick that he had against Jared Goff, week two. Great, awesome. Momentum shifting. And then I think of moments of weakness. He can get big boyed. He can get his hips turned. Think about Rashad Higgins' touchdown that sealed the Cleveland game for us. The reason why that play sticks out to me is because I was there in Cleveland and I had to watch that. That did not feel good. I didn't blame Levi for it, but I, I you know... I didn't I didn't enjoy it either. <laughs> um I think the Bills have always tried to find someone to bring in for Levi to compete with and he's always come out on top, right? I think about Josh Norman and before that I think about EJ Gaines. It, it Kevin, Kevin Johnson. Johnson like Levi has always just come out on top. So I don't know if next year will be different. But who knows? Justin, tell us about Levi. So Levi for me is a guy I initially had typed up a full page on notes uh, on Levi Wallace alone. Um, there's some highs and lows with him, but I think that's kind of part of what comes with playing cornerback to opposite of Trey White. Right. You're going to get targeted. You're going to get picked on. Um, but for what this scheme asks of him, he keeps the play in front of him, and he's a very sure tackler. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes on third and eight, he allows a nine-yard pass, but he makes the tackle. Mm -hmm. um, so, like you said, we've brought in a lot of competition to try to beat him out for that job. I do think CB2 is one of the biggest needs on this team. Um, it's kind of where I want to go in the draft and see, you know, if that player beats out Levi. But... Levi's scrappy, man. He's not giving up that job. He, he said he, he wanted to come back to Buffalo. Don't counter any offers. This team's about to win a Super Bowl. And that means something oh, to yeah. me. Like That guy's playing with fire, and he was an undrafted player, and he might not be the best player on the field at all times, but that dude's playing hungry. And that fits in with Sean McDermott, hungry, uh, humble and hungry. Yeah. Definitely got to be humble and hungry. So I'm down for it. Let's move on to Teron Johnson. Remember early in the season, Justin, a lot of Bills Mafia was calling for this head. And no, that's not a play on his infamous combine collision where he gets pelted in the head with a football going through the gauntlet. He definitely started off shaky. I will agree with that. And I think he got benched for Cam Lewis at one point. He and he came back with a vengeance. He needed that little uh, little reality check for him to come back and work harder. And he he showed it. He got two pick six, sixes that can be considered franchise altering, right? I might get flack for this, but I think the Bills could upgrade at this position. I thought Duggard or Chin in last year's draft, if we had drafted him, would have usurped him real quick. 
if the Bills would have gone, you know, drafted either of them. But it didn't happen. And it works out because Teron Johnson ended up playing fine. He got those two pick sixes. But who's to say the Bills aren't looking at the nickel corner position as we speak at a, as a spot that could be upgraded? I don't know. Justin, how do you feel? Uh, so Taron Johnson, for me, he's like Buffalo folk, folklore at this mm-hmm. point. Um, he had those plays, and it's, it's kind of like thinking about replacing him sounds like sacrilegious um but for me it it feels like that's a position that this regime has been targeting um you'll hear me say his name all the time jeremiah usukoromoa if we can pull that dude and he can kind of play that role where he's kind of a linebacker kind of a safety he erases the tight ends i definitely think it's a spot on the roster that could be upgraded but recency bias included ignoring the early season struggles if it's Taron Johnson next year sure I'm fine with it uh, I think he kind of earned his way into that mm-hmm. spot um, but if it's something that they look to upgrade I would not be mad about right. that let's move on Dane Jackson I like Dane Jackson of course when everyone thinks about Dane Jackson at least for me I think about that pass breakup against D Hop. I, How can yeah, you not? Right? I, just seeing the man one-on-one, I thought to myself, well, that's an easy six. He's going to just body our seventh-round pick. But he held up, and he broke up the pass, which is great. And that's a, definitely an early highlight on his tape. But I need to see more before I'm convinced. This situation almost reminds me of the how Levi came on strong towards the end of the 2018 season. But maybe this is different. Brandon B. did speak highly of him on that uh, podcast, Chris Collinsworth podcast. So we'll see, but I personally need to see more, Justin. Tell us about Dane Jackson. Yeah, he looked great in the sample size that we saw of him. Um, I have this cautious optimism where, like, I'm super on board with Dane Jackson, but everybody, not everybody, a lot of people I talk to is like, Oh, just let Levi walk. We got Dane Jackson. Let him come in and take that job. And it's kind of like we already had that in Levi Wallace where he was an undrafted free agent and ended up being a passable starter for a few years. And Dane Jackson we drafted, but it was a seventh-round pick. And just statistically, those guys don't work out. So I'm not really in a rush to see him replace Mm -hmm. Levi. But in a normal off season, full training camp and all that, I love to see him compete with Levi and see what shakes out. I'm also fully on board with uh, bringing in another talent to compete with both of them and see if we can upgrade all together. Right, right. Let's uh, wrap up this room. We're going to talk about Saran Neal here. He's a specials team player. Not much of a corner. He doesn't really see a lot of time out there. That's probably, again, a pretty good thing. And then Cam Lewis. He played in the slot when the Bills needed answers for Teron Johnson's poor play. And I'm using air quotes here for a reason because, he, of course, he came back with a vengeance, as I just stated a moment ago. He ended up getting hurt. I think he broke, like, what, his hand or wrist or something? Something along that. Something that required a large Yes, cast. yeah, so he had the club for sure. And we never really got to see him again. Uh, I, I remember the tackle that he had, get, had against Derrick Henry. That was pretty cool. He stuck him and stopped him in place, so that was cool. I don't know what to think about him, but who knows what the future holds. Maybe he could develop into something good. So, Justin, tell us about Saran and Cam. So, Saran is a guy that I love for what he brings uh, in the special teams phase of the game. Um, We kind of used him a little bit in like the big nickel kind of role where we're trying to use him to cover a tight end. I think he's serviceable as a backup and a rotation piece, Um, but any extended time that we see him on the field I think is a negative for us. And then Cam Lewis for me, if you're on board with upgrading from Taron Johnson, I just want to tell you that this guy is not the person for it. Um... He's a product of UB. 
I love seeing a hometown story kind of like hit home and all that. He's kind of like a fringe NFL roster player. He might go somewhere else and end up getting some decent playing time. Maybe even end up being a nickel somewhere. But with how deep this roster is, I just don't think that we see much more of Cam Lewis on this right, team. Right, I think this team is too good to try something like that. But, you know, they... Yeah. And if he sticks around on a practice squad, sure. We'll see what, what happens, yeah. but... I just don't think he's that guy. Yeah, we'll definitely have to see. Who knows what the future holds. So that wraps up the cornerback room. Let's talk about what the Bills did in free agency. So the Bills re-signed Levi Walsh to a one-year deal. We all know about his comments about coming back because the Bills are going to win the Super Bowl. I love that energy, so I'm all for bringing back Levi Wallace. The option was also picked up on Trey White's contract, Justin. So that freed up about... $7.6 $7.6 million. Basically, they went up to Tredavious White and said, hey, do you want like $9 million up front right now? Are you cool with that? Are you? Yeah, I'm good with that. <laughs> Trey yeah, was like, if you're going to cool bend my arm, sure. Yeah, whatever, dude. <laughs> so, very cool. But he will be very pricely next year when he carries a $16.5 million cap hit. But well worth the price, in, uh, in my opinion, especially since he's giving us the fuck flexibility to bring people in justin tell us your thoughts about the free agency moves that we made in regards to the cornerback position so i wanted to bring back levi wallace just for that at the very least you know what you have in him and it gives you the draft flexibility um if we were going to try to upgrade the only person i really liked in free agency was william jackson uh, Mm -hmm. from the Bengals. He ended up signing a pretty hefty contract with Washington. Um, a name I hear a lot is Richard Sherman coming to Buffalo. I'm, I'm so out on that. I can't even put it into words. Richard Sherman's one of those guys that's like a player in name. He's He's getting up there in age. He can still play football, but he's kind of just like a better version of Levi Wallace that's older and costs more money. Um, this is something I'd, I'd like to see addressed kind of early in the draft. Just bring in some con- um, some uh, competition in one of the early rounds and see what shakes out. I want to see somebody try to beat out Levi for the job and actually mm-hmm. take it. Um, but if Levi keeps earning that spot, he's kind of earned it in my book at this point. And somebody's got to take him out to take him out, you know? Right. You know... I wouldn't be upset if the Bills got Richard Sherman. I don't dislike him, but I'm not interested in paying a lot of money for him. If they can bring him in on something real cheap, I'm all for it. So we might have a slight disagreements here on the Wandering Buffalo See, podcast. See, for me, he brings in that Rex Ryan effect. What? Where like you get the you get all the attention for the wrong reason, where you're just loud for no reason. I think maybe that was true to who he was back in the day but i i feel like he's he's aged like a fine wine (laughs) okay maybe maybe not for his play but like you know i think he maybe he's maybe past that uh loud stage (laughs) Um, at this juncture it likes it likely doesn't happen but i'd like to see it shake out either way if it does and we can talk about it again later yeah i could be wrong and or you could be right who knows uh let's talk about some draft prospects justin we're in a good spot to take a defensive back if we want to. But I'm always interested about who would be a good fit for us. And if I'm reading this situation correctly, that doesn't mean we have to take someone at 30 to be a good fit in regards to a cornerback, right, Justin? Correct. All right, tell us about um, two to three prospects. So I have a kind of overall draft strategy that I would go with. If, if I was in Bean's position, which I never will be. Um, so kind of what I'd be looking at in this draft is drafting that star caliber cornerback that in four to five years we're talking about extending that player and maybe we let Tredavious walk and then you draft the next guy to be the CB2. Um, so that's where I would be looking early in the draft, round one or round two. Um before all that, if we can make 
I've already talked about him. I'll keep talking about him. If we can make Jeremiah Owusu-Koromo happen, that is the guy that's a game changer for this defense. I likely don't think he makes it to 30, but if we if he does, I'll be so happy. Um, another guy that might not make it to 30, Caleb Farley. Um, he's been kind of flagged. He's had two back surgeries before he comes into the NFL. The dude is an athletic freak. Um, he can do man, he can do zone, he can do all that. And I think that gives us kind of some traits that we don't have on the defense right now at CB2. You're putting you're putting a lot of stock in a guy that, you know, might have some red flags. So it's kind of waiting on what the medicals bring back on that guy. Um, and, you know, 30 other... 32 other team, 31 other teams in the NFL are going to get those results back too. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, he ran a 4-2-8 at 6-1-2-10. Mm-hmm. Like, that's an athlete on the outside that we don't have right now. Right, right. Um, my realistic options, maybe Greg Newsome, um, round one, and then my ideal scenario if we go second round uh, if Yatu Melifanwu, yes. I wish we had Louie on right now to talk about Syracuse right now. But if Yatu fits everything we do perfectly, he does cover two, cover three, all that. He's a big guy. He'll come lay the hammer on you. Um, I think he'll probably be there in round two if that's when we decide to address it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I really think he would be an upgrade over the Levi Wallace position and could really kind of change the dynamic of the defense. Right, right. That, you know, injuries sound scary, so I don't I don't think, what was his name, Farley? Caleb Farley? Yeah, Caleb Farley. Doesn't sound like he might be someone that uh, the Bills would be willing to take a chance on or any team in the first round. But I do like that second uh, second round cornerback prospect out of Syracuse, and the reason why if I'm... He to. Yeah. I, I I can't pronounce the man's name, so I'm, I'm just going to let you do it. That's okay. <laughs> um, well, I think that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode, everyone. Next week, we have a very fun episode for you. Justin, we have the mock draft episode. In addition to that, we have our combine results. Yes, Justin, me, and the executive producer did the combine workouts. We're talking 40-yard dash, broad jump, high jump, and of course, the 225 bench press. Uh, come join oh, the show. Boy. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe, rate, Just leave a review, and it would be much appreciated. Again, you can follow us on social media by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. And if you want to be a part of our show, give us a DM. Justin? You can find me on social medias at jgods22. If you watch nothing else, Tune in next week for the Combine episode. It's going to be great. I'm really proud of what we did there. Uh, not necessarily not necessarily the results, but the whole effort of it was really fun. So tune in and join us. Right, and you can find me on social media by searching 2 Changs. And, you know, going back to that Combine episode real quick, we called it the Average Joe's Combine because we're going to deliver you some average results. Well, Let's be honest, some below average results. <laughs> but until then, everyone, have a great week, and we'll catch you next week. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills.